I'm Reeves Bird with the Absolute Sound, and I'm here at Western Electric with uh, Charles Whitener, who is the CEO of Western Electric. Um, he's really brought this company back with a vision uh, that's pretty pretty impressive. So, I like we just did a factory tour, and it was quite impressive. It is amazing to me how much goes into uh, the the 300B, or probably really any two. Um, but I'd like to talk with uh, Charles about about your journey. When did when did this start for you? This started in, I guess, about 1990 or 91. Um, I had a, a company in the uh, 80s called Microdynamics. We built uh, automatic inspection equipment and uh, some textile processing equipment. My father was in the yarn manufacturing business for the carbon industry, so I grew up in textiles and worked for him for several years and, and uh, learned a lot in that, in that trade. And so in 1982, we uh, moved into, the, into Georgia Tech. We were just very, a very young company. We moved into Georgia Tech's incubator called the Advanced Technology Development Center at Georgia Tech. I think we were the very first company, in fact. We were the guinea pigs. The very first company at the ATDC, and we were there for about 10 years, or eight years, rather. And I think I sold the company around 1990 um, to another company that was involved with a, a Swiss firm in, in a similar business. And I had a non-compete agreement, so I, uh, started looking around for some audio equipment. I was free and sort of out of a job and had a little bit of money and uh, after having sold the company. And I was looking at the, the, the rear uh, classified areas of absolute sound and also stereophile. And I kept seeing these uh, want ads in the back, wanted Western Electric amplifiers, wanted these, these tubes and so forth. And, and I, uh, Thought, well, this is an opportunity to bring back the glory of Western Electric's audio equipment days. And approached AT&T, uh, who of course owned Western Electric at that point. And uh, over a period of uh, a couple of years, we entered into agreement where I could, at least at that point, have a license to manufacture the tubes under the Western, Western Electric name. It was several years after that, that we became owners of the technology and the company and the name. But in the beginning, it was a license agreement. Okay. So, so how did you pull that together? I mean, when did Western Electric stop making tubes and when did you start making tubes? Western Electric made tubes at uh, several plants over the years. Uh, they made uh, tubes at the uh, Hawthorne Works in Ch right outside of Chicago and Cicero. They made tubes at the Allentown Works uh, in Pens Allentown, Pennsylvania. And in the from 59 on, they made electron tubes at the Kansas City Works in Lee Summit, Missouri. And so um, the last 300B was built in 1988 on the existing line at Western Electric. So it was a period of about four years before, uh, let's say a high ed is, before they stopped manufacturing, we started back up actually at the same location. So we, we uh, started the, the manufacturing line back up with the same tooling, the same employees. A lot of them came out of retirement to start back to the, the line in Kansas City. Did you run into any, any challenges pulling this off, bringing it back? Um, you know, it, there were of course challenges, but because we hired I think there were almost 25 retirees we hired. And because we had not only the line workers, but we had engineering staff that was still there that helped us get through the, the challenges of the engineering side. Um, it really was uh, happened pretty quickly. Right, so you had, so you had the know-how. We had the know-how. Yeah. Uh, we, we had the technology and the know-how. We had all the original drawings, uh, all the original tooling. We did have to build from scratch quite a few new pieces of equipment okay. to um, 
to build the teams with. But that was, uh, and we had a, a really great team to uh, put that together. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my uh, partners at that time was a guy named James Patterson. He was from Scotland and he was uh, adept at uh, machine design and um, had uh, a lot of input on the machine side of the machine design and this. So between Patterson and the team we had there, we pulled it off pretty quickly. And and so how quick was it you started shipping 300B tubes? We didn't start shipping uh, tubes until 1997. However, we didn't get the, it took, like I said, two or three years to get the license mm-hmm. once we approached, AT, AT, approached AT&T. So I think from the time we signed the agreement, which was in 95, I think it took, well, it took about two years to pull everything together, mm-hmm. to build a plant from scratch uh, and, and pull it all together. In fact, it was uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day of 1997, we, we produced the first set of tubes. So one of the things you told me about, there's uh, in touring the factory, the innovation's amazing. You know, what, what you guys have done. Um, I, I didn't know a lot about tube manufacturing, but I knew it was complicated. But the number of steps in making a 300B, how, how many are there? The 300B has about 55 steps and or processes that we have to go through to uh, deliver a good tube. Yeah. And, um, and I think there are almost 60 parts in the, in the 300B too, 60 separate parts. And um, so we, I, you know, a lot of the innovation that you saw is not our innovation, but it, there, were, there were innovations that we have inherited from Bell Laboratories that, of course, designed the 300B. Bell Labs was a division of Western Electric. But it also seemed that there is, as I could tell, some new steps in terms of uh, taking the quality level to, to you know, something that nobody's ever really seen. Yes, we, we empl- we've uh, employed turbo molecular pumps for the vacuum that gives us a superior ultra-high vacuum. We've uh, added graphene into the mix where we coat our anodes with graphene. We've added some processes in the, fil- uh, in the filament creation that gives us a, a, a better uh, quality, longer life filament. So yes, we've, we've instituted some, some new things. And, and, and one of the things I think is really neat is the story about graphene. Yeah, as I uh, was uh, conveying to you, the, the graphene came out, came out just by mistake. We were, as a result of a, a, a supplier that we had lost, and they were the only company in the world left that was making carbonized nickel, uh, and they, they uh, disappeared with a, quite a bit of our consigned nickel. Uh, which was the base material that we, we carbonized, we started experiment, experimenting with how to make carbonized nickel ourselves. And the, the process was quite dangerous. And, and I was warned uh, about this by a, a veteran engineer at, at Sylvania. He uh, went to great lengths to, to warn me about the, the nature of the process. And it was dangerous. And the reason it was dangerous is because the, car- the, the carbon-rich gases used in, in uh, carbonizing nickel were devoid of a, a, a chemical called mercaptan. Mercaptan is the is the is the um, sulfur-based uh, gas or, or chemical they add to your natural gas at home, <clears throat> so that you can you can smell uh, when you have a leak. Natural gas has no odor. And you can't. It's 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 uh, clear, and you know it's uh, and it has no odor. But to add more captain, you can tell immediately that you've got a gas leak. Well, you can't use sulfur anywhere near a, uh, an electron two plant. The two things that will kill you or poison the cathode. One is uh, chlorides, and the other is, is sulfur. So because you couldn't detect whether you had a, a gas that was um, leaking, it could cause a major explosion in, in, in the room where you were. So you had to have quite a, an elaborate uh, system of gas detection. And so rather than go down that path, we uh, did some experimentation that would make it uh, 
safer. And as a result of that, the, the, the effort to be safe, it, we, we, we created graphene. It, the direct result of that, that effort that, that uh, caused us to come up with graphene. And, and the graphene is giving you, again, this, is, this goes back to longer lasting tubes. And yeah, the graphene will give, give you better performing tubes in two or three ways. One, it gives you longer life because graphene, as you know, is only one atomic layer of carbon. So you don't have a thick layer that will occlude other gases or poisons or uh, chemicals in the anode. So when the, as the tube ages, there's nothing, so to speak, there to, to outgas in the tube. Um, the other thing that graphene will do is it will give you a much better electrical conducti conductivity than graphite or carbon almost five times the electrical, electrical conductivity. So hence you have a better uh, electron affinity uh, you know, across the, the, the vacuum and the electrodes. And then the, the third thing that's most important for us was the issue of thermal emissivity. Thermal em the, the reason all tubes that ha are dark in, in color is because they have to have a, what's called the black body effect in the anode, which allows the heat to be transmitted or emitted away from the tube, getting the through infrared energy away from the tube to keep it cool. <clears throat> a clear anode, when I say clear, I mean uncarbonized or ungraphened, uh, will only give you a thermal emissivity of maybe 70%, where graphene gives you a, a thermal emissivity of maybe 99%. So 99% of the heat is, is transmitted. Okay. One of the things that really impressed me when we were going through the factory, um, you all pretty much, you basically do everything in house. There, it doesn't look like there's really any outside steps. And the impression that I got going through the factory is this is not to save money. This is to have the best possible quality control and the best possible uh, component at every single step of the process. Is that was that your vision? Or what you were well, I think that I mean that's been something I've tried to sustain. I don't think it was my vision. I think that was the vision of of how Western Electric was was founded and their history, and also the Bell Labs uh, innovation and, and vision. We, with few exceptions, we uh, follow precisely to the letter the Bell Bell Labs documentation. But you've built on that. You, the graphene we, we, have, is so we have improved on a few things mm -hmm. as technologies have, have improved that weren't available years ago. However, many people have learned, including ourselves, that if you try to go around the Bell Labs document, it never works. Okay. They, they have figured it out. Yeah, yeah. At great expense and, and great, great uh, time and expense. Well, in. Um, and this might sound like a simple thing, but it, it was quite impressive, and we have shots of it. The, um, the cleaning of the glass, ensuring that that glass is absolutely clean for manufacturing the tubes, the distilled water, the process that you do, I mean, all, all leading towards that superior quality. Well, though, it's, it's really deionized water, uh, and the reason it's deionized is we have to remove any ions from the water that would make the moisture or anything on the surface that we leave conductive. Um, and of course we we pump water up into the bulb, each and every bulb, thoroughly for over 45 minutes per bulb to thoroughly clean any contaminants that, that, that might have been picked up in the glass manufacturing process or shipping. So let's, um, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about um, you're, you're now, you've, you've got a few amplifiers on the market. Um, was that the goal at the beginning? Did you, did you start out thinking, okay, we're gonna make tubes and now we're gonna make amplifiers? Yes, but we, you know, the, the, you can't make the amplifier without the tube. Right. So you, and, and, and it's far easier to make an amplifier than it is a tube. So we had to get the hard thing done first and, and we've been doing that for a number of years. Um, the 91A, of course, is a, a famous Amplifier that, that was built by Western many years ago for the for the uh, theater business, 
and we wanted to build on that legacy and have used many of the many of the uh, engineering as aspects of the original 91A and the 91E. Now we've improved on that dramatically, but but use some of the early technology that Western Electric patented on that, on yeah, that amplifier. I think the, the transformer <clears throat> is one of those unique things that you added to it. Well, it's unique, but not totally unique. Western Electric developed parallel feed uh, topology and output topology for amplifiers back in the 30s. Um, however, we have added some patented circuitry to that that allows us to, to uh, almost well almost triple the power from a 300B. And that's the, the stable? That's the, what we call the steered constant current source. Right. Um, it's just a, a better way to to perform a parallel feed circuit. But we didn't invent the parallel parallel feed circuit. Western uh, Bell Labs did. But you improved it through that? We improved on it, yes. Yeah. Um, what uh, let's talk a little bit about the about the future more more tubes for Western Electric. Yes, we we have uh, been involved in the last uh, I'd say six months in conversations with several of the large guitar amplifier OEMs that we will, we will be serving. And but before that, we were we had made the decision back as gosh as long as. 2006 actually to build a 12ax7 slash ecc83 mm -hmm. and in that exercise or that or that that plan we had purchased all the equipment from a company in Serbia that was called Elektronska Industria and EI was the depository and they received all the equipment from originally Mullard, uh, Phillips Mullard in the UK and Blackburn, England. So all of that original hardware was delivered to, the, to, the, to uh, Serbia. And we purchased that in 2006 with the vision of, in the future, serving the MI business or, or the guitar business. And we've had that equipment in storage for a number of years and we, over the last couple of years, we have been uh, reconstituting and, and bringing all that equipment into new condition mm -hmm. and that will be sh uh, received in the US probably in about 90 days that will be part of this exercise in producing tubes for the guitar amplifier customer which may also be for the audiophile customer as well. definitely 12x7 as you know is, is ubiquitous in the in the high-end audio business as well but there's several other tubes in, in a new platform we've designed. We have a, we have a new way of, of assembling tubes that we've developed that uses uh, robots and, um, and laser welding that will make the, the tube more reliable and uh, a lot faster to build. Yeah, you're... you're and uh, more repeatable. Your facility, how long have you been in the facility? This, this new facility is our third plant that we've built. And this one, we started in 2016. We bought we bought the real estate in 2016. It was 20, I think it was 2020 before we started actually shipping tubes. Mm -hmm. So it took us a couple of years to to uh, get everything in, in place and and uh, proved in for the tube and, manufacturing. And how large is the facility? This this facility is 38,000 square feet. Okay, and the. Um you mentioned the laser welding. You guys are making a huge investment in, in manufacturing. I mean, what can you share kind of the, the type of investment you're making? This is a this is a major commitment that you're making. To, I mean, we we are we're tubes. we're investing several million dollars in, in the in the new plant. Or have already invested several million and we'll have to invest several more before we're done. But uh, yes, we've we've made a commitment to to build uh, the most advanced, uh, finest tube plant in the world. And the last thing I want to uh, mention is uh, you all's warranty on your tubes. I think that really sets you apart from everybody else. Nobody yes. has a warranty like... Yes, we have a, a five-year warranty on the, on the 300B. And uh, I think the competition 
there are a couple of competitors that say they have a, a one year warranty. And, but most of the competition is, is uh, 90 days. Right, right. So your tubes are more expensive, but with a five year warranty, if you look at it with the, that kind of longevity, well, I think also, uh, not, not only are they longer life, but I think universally you will hear reported from customers that they sound significantly better mm -hmm. than the competition. I, I don't doubt that one bit based on what I've seen and what I've heard, for sure. Well, thank you. Is there any other words that you'd like to add? I think that'll do it. Okay, terrific.